Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash Canada EHX. There are various levels of support with everything from early episodes, special episodes, swag, and much more. And you can donate to the podcast by going to CanadaEHX.com and clicking Donate. Don't forget, I have two other podcasts out there, Pucks and Cups and From John to Justin, available on all podcast platforms, releasing every single week. This episode is sponsored by the community of Claire's Home. Today, I'm looking at the history of Claire's Home, Alberta, a really unique community in southern Alberta. And as usual, I won't be going through a chronological look at the community, but rather looking at various segments of its history and current historical tourist attractions. Indigenous History The area around Clare's home has been inhabited by the indigenous for thousands of years before the arrival of Europeans. In fact, about a half hour to the south of Clare's home near Fort McLeod, you will find head smashed in Buffalo Jump. This World Heritage Site was where thousands of bison were killed in a systematic operation by the indigenous that involved moving the bison herd as a group over a cliff where they would die at the bottom. The ability to kill bison this way allowed for more leisure time for the indigenous groups in the area, which allowed their culture to flourish prior to the arrival of Europeans. Traditionally, the area where Claire's home sits was originally the home of the Blackfoot and the Stony Nakoda. As Europeans began to push from the east, the Cree and Métis would come into the area in the 1800s, leading to minor conflicts between the groups until peace was achieved in the late 1800s. The land today is covered by Treaty 7, which was signed in 1877 to the north of the community in Blackfoot Crossing. The Founding of the Community The first recorded permanent settler in the area was Henry Kuntz, who came from Pennsylvania around 1870. At the time, he made his living as a bison hunter, and the indigenous called him Lone Bull because he always hunted alone. Originally, the location was a spot for steam engines to stop in order to take on water along the Canadian Pacific Railway line along the McLeod Trail. The first trains arrived in the area around 1891, with the first station consisting of just a boxcar. It would not be until 1895 that a proper building was built. For ranchers, the railroad stopping point was a perfect place to take their cattle for shipping elsewhere on the continent. Slowly, people began to arrive, with the first being William Moffat, who came from Pilot Mound, Manitoba, with ten carloads of lumber. Not only was he the first resident of Clare's home, but he would be the first mayor, and eventually, the first MLA for the area. On May 30, 1903, the village of Clare's home was established. During that first year, the community had a lumberyard, post office, hardware store, and two hotels. Two years later, on August 31, 1905, it had become a town. Interestingly, this was the last official act of the territorial government because the next day, Alberta was born. A big part of the sudden growth is thanks to a man by the name of Ole Amundsen, who arrived in 1902 from Norway via North Dakota, bringing with him many early settlers of a Norwegian heritage. For where the name comes from, as with many prairie communities, it takes its name from a prominent citizen. In this case, it was a woman named Claire. Although there is also the claim that it was named by John Niblock, the superintendent of the CPR between Medicine Hat and Calgary, who named it after his wife, who was back home in Medicine Hat, named Claire. The Claire's Home and District Museum Many rural towns have wonderful museums, and Clare's home is no exception. Through the museum, you will be able to relive the history of the area, starting with the pre-contact Blackfoot culture, to the arrival of the railway, to the ranchers who lived around Clare's home, all the way up to today. The museum itself was established in 1969 and is located in the CPR train station, a building I will be speaking about later. Within the station, you will find a station's agent's office, an exhibit dedicated to the hospitals of Claire's home, as well as one for Louise McKinney. More on her later. The exhibit hall, which is 8,000 square feet, features exhibits that highlight the indigenous history of the area, the Northwest Mounted Police, and the ranching history. There is also a blacksmith shop, telephone office, general store, 
a 1930s house, a land agent office, a newspaper office, a barber shop, and displays honoring the military, churches, firefighters, and farmers of the area. Venturing outside the museum, there is a 1903 schoolhouse, a 1920s log cabin, a CPR caboose, and a CPR speeder car that is brought out for the summer season. The museum is open in the spring and summer and admission is free, but of course donations are always accepted. The Clare's Home School of Agriculture In 1911, the Department of Agriculture decided to purchase a piece of land near Clare's Home to set up a demonstration farm. It was from this that the Clare's Home School of Agriculture was born. School buildings would be constructed in 1912, and on November 19, 1913, the school was officially opened, but classes had actually begun earlier on October 28th. At the opening, Ann Holmes, the mayor of Clare's home was on hand, as well as the Minister of Public Works, the Minister of Education, the President of the University of Alberta, and several other members of Parliament and the Alberta Legislature. In total, 500 people attended the big event. One important historical note about the school was that the Clare's Home School had the largest initial class of any similar institution on the continent. Of that first class, 16 would go on to attend the University of Alberta. The school would operate every year until 1931, except during the Spanish flu epidemic when it was turned into a hospital. The school would eventually be turned into a provincial auxiliary mental hospital and is now the site of the Clare's Home Centre for Mental Health Addictions. Clare's Home in World War II and the Industrial Airport One of the most significant events for Clare's Home was the outbreak of the Second World War. Under the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan, Base 15 Service Flying Training School was operated from June 9, 1941 to March 1945 in Clare's Home. The first commanding officer of the base was Wing Commander Campbell, and by August 16, 1941, the first class of students had completed their training and were ready to receive their wings. At the ceremony, Lieutenant Governor J. E. Bowlin would attend the special day, as would the mayor of Clare's home. Many people from town came out to see the big event as well. On October 15, 1941, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor came to the base for a visit and to complete an inspection. The Duke presented wings to the graduating class of Course 34, and he told the pilots he appreciated their hard work. On February 23, 1942, the Women's Division of the Air Force arrived and soon after, the number 2 Flying Instructor School was established. The training school was not without accidents. The most notable happened when two pilots were flying a crane. The plane suddenly had engine failure and dove into the barracks block, crashing through the roof of the barracks and landing on top of the bunks. Thankfully, it only pinned one man who was sleeping. The other man, who was on the top bunk, had gone to the washroom, likely saving his life. As for the man who was trapped under the plane, he escaped mostly unharmed. Another big visit came to the base in May of 1942, when Her Royal Highness Princess Alice and His Excellency the Earl of Athlone visited the station and inspected the Guard of Honour. The final event of the Flying Training School happened on March 29, 1945, when courses 121 and 122 received their wings, amounting to 122 airmen. Pilots would return to the base in 1951 when it was used to train pilots for the Korean War, operating as a number 3 flight training school while also training NATO pilots. This new facility had 1,100 personnel with 140 housing units on the base, as well as a school for 250 children. Orrin Matson served as the principal of that school. As well, there was a grocery store, two churches, and a barber shop. The first class at the base would graduate, consisting of 30 pilots, on March 8, 1952. The first NATO personnel class graduated on October 22, 1952. The base would close on August 25, 1958, and the hangars were converted into industrial use. A part of the base would eventually operate as the Clare's Home Industrial Airport. The 1928 Tornado for one resident near Clare's home, August 27, 1928 was a very troubling day. It was on that day, on the land of Carl Wiedner, when a very brief tornado moved through the area causing havoc on several farms as well. Carl had seen the storm coming and recognized what it was. 
He let his horses loose and got his family into the car where he quickly drove them to the nearby school. They were able to escape any injury, but on his farm the barn was wrecked, as were his granaries and the chicken and pig pens. Several pigs and chickens were killed, and his house was severely damaged. In the house, bedding and clothing were tossed everywhere, and dishes were even found in the cellar as the tornado had torn the cellar doors open. His machinery and tools were found all over the area, and some were never found again. Over on the land of Frank Keir, his crops were destroyed and several trees were torn up. One person in the house was hurt, and two others escaped injury by running into the root cellar. To help those impacted, many in Claire's home raised money and gave it to the families to help them rebuild. The 1946 Fire Fires are a constant danger for any community, especially in the first half of the 20th century. Claire's home had already dealt with the terrible fire that destroyed the Wilton Hotel in 1930, but on March 28, 1946, fire gutted through several businesses in the middle of the night. The fire alarm had gone off at 12.30 a.m., and by 12.45 a.m., the fire brigade was out and dealing with the fire at Cuthbert's Bolodrome. At the same time, a legion dance was being held and several of the dancers came out to see the fire or to assist in any way that they could. It was believed that the fire had started at the bowling alley and spread due to the strong winds towards the front of the building. The fire then jumped over to the Harwood Meat Market and then the Volunteer Fire Brigade worked through the night to save what they could. To the east of the bowling alley, the fire hit the McKenzie building and several firefighters were on the roof trying to control the embers. But then the wind shifted and began burning inside the building and moving upwards towards the roof. The firefighters were forced to get off the roof as quickly as they could. At this point the fire was growing and a call was put to Fort McLeod who responded with a truck and six firefighters. After burning down the bowling alley, Harwood's meat market and the McKenzie building, the funeral parlor of W.G. Ringrose was hit, becoming the fourth building to start to burn. Most of the damage in the building wasn't from the flames, but the water to put out the flames. By 5 a.m. after working all night, the fire was under control. As light came to Claire's home, the bowling alley was gone, Harwoods was gutted, as was the McKenzie building. Total damages were estimated at $15,000, or $212,000 today. The 1967 Snowstorm Snow in late April and early May is nothing unusual, but the snowstorm that hit Claire's home on April 25, 1967 was something else. It was the night before when a heavy and wet snow began to fall. Soon enough, visibility was cut to nearly zero and huge drifts began to appear on the roads as winds whipped up the snow to compound the fact that only 10 days earlier, two feet of snow had fallen. Before long, the snow was blocking roads and caused the power to go out for up to 48 hours in some places. Many people were stranded from their homes and ranchers could not get food to their cattle. Sadly, for many, newborn calves were lost to the storm. To deal with this, under the direction of Tom Slemko, a helicopter service was set up to feed stranded cattle. Dubbed Operation Haylift, three helicopters took hay into the air and then dropped it near the stranded cattle. This ran for three days until ranchers could get to their cattle. The heavy snow on roofs caused problems and there was a concern that the rink's roof would collapse. Volunteers came out and began shoveling off the roof to protect it. At the same time, town workers kept lanes open in the community in case there was a fire or medical emergency. As can be expected, school was closed for several days. Cars were also buried and there were some minor accidents. There was so much snow that it had to be piled in the middle of the street for clearing, but thankfully, cool temperatures allowed the snow to be cleared and no flooding was reported. The Harvard Memorial When you drive through Claire's home, you will come across a plane that is currently sitting in the center of Centennial Park. This plane was erected in 1998 as a special project put forward by Bill Erickson and friends. It serves to honor the pilots who trained in the community during the Second World War in the 1950s and the personnel who were stationed in the community during those training programs. The plane on display is a yellow Harvard and many of the young student pilots who came through before going overseas to fight in the Second World War in Korea were trained in a yellow Harvard like the one on display. The 
the Clare's Home Murals. I come from Stony Plain, a town that has dozens of murals depicting its past, so I have a special love of towns that show their history through murals, and Clare's Home is one such town. There are several murals in Clare's Home that look at its history. Where the Wheatlands Meet the Range was painted in 2002 to depict the ranching and farming life of Clare's Home around 1902. The mural depicts wheat on one side, which was the principal crop grown east of town, and on the other side of the mural is cattle raising, which was the principal use of the land west of town. In the middle is an early depiction of Clare's Home. A Clare's Home celebration was painted in 2003, and it shows the community coming together in Abinson Park to celebrate in the early years of the community. The Ring Rose Park Quadra Pitch features several murals that honour women, farmers, the elders and the indigenous. It was painted in 2012 and it shows Clare's home in four images, before European contact when the Blackfoot were in the region, the early years of Clare's home before cars arrived, the NATO years when Harvard trainers flew over Clare's home every day, and the present that includes Hutterites selling their produce at a farmer's market. I'd like to take a break away from the episode for a second, to talk about ExploreNet. I spent most of my life living in rural areas in Canada, and I remember the days of dial-up internet and spotty high-speed service. For the past three years, I have been a customer of ExploreNet, and I can honestly say that it is the best rural internet I have ever had. My job as a podcaster means I spend a lot of time researching online, interviewing people over Zoom, and uploading content. Through it all, ExploreNet has provided me with excellent service. When I'm not working, I enjoy streaming content on several streaming platforms and even doing some online gaming with a friend in Ontario. ExploreNet allows me to do all of that with ease. Right now, they offer up to 50 megabits per second on their new LTE network with unlimited data. Their service has only become faster and better since I first signed on. Today and beyond, ExploreNet is investing in building and upgrading the network at a rapid pace. ExploreNet is rural, and that is their route, and that is their focus. For more information about rural internet options in your area, go to ExploreNet.com or call 1-866-285-2253. The Water Tower You don't see too many water towers anymore. With modern water treatment and distribution systems, water towers are a relic of the past. While most towns demolished them, Clare's home chose to preserve its tower. The tower itself was built in 1909 and completed in 1910. It was used to pump water from the nearby Willow Creek to supply residents of the town. Originally, the tower was black, but it was painted silver in the 1950s. Without this water tower, it is likely that Clare's home would have never gone far beyond its early population level. By October of 1909, Clare's home was facing a serious shortage of water in the town. Throughout that year, pipe was being put into the ground from Willow Creek to the water tower to bring water to its residents. By the 1980s, a new water system made the tower obsolete, but the tower was not torn down, and today, its role in the history of the community is celebrated in the municipal logo of the town. Canada's first school bus. One thing I love about small community histories is you never know what interesting tidbit of information you will find. Case in point, Canada's first motorized school bus, or at least that is what some people theorize. The bus, which was a motor bus on a Model T Ford Chasis, was first used to take children to school in 1919, replacing the horse-drawn school bus children used since 1916. In that year, the Ruby School District had decided to begin moving its students into Clare's home, which was located about 25 kilometers away. The decision was made to do this rather than build a school themselves. The old horse-drawn school bus took an hour and a half to take children to school, but in 1919, with the new school bus, it took only half an hour. The school bus was used until 1938 when it was traded in for a new panel truck. At this point, the old school bus was sold to Carl Smedstad, and then to Marvin Mosley, who used it as a playhouse for his children. Instead of eventually winding up in a junkyard, its historical value was seen, and it was renovated, and Ken Hurlbert, the mayor of Fort McLeod, donated it to the Clare's Home Museum.
The Historical Buildings and Places The leavings at Willow Creek consist of a small log house, a log, and a sandstone barn, a log stable, and a well, plantings, and a cart trail. The site located near Clare's home was first settled in 1875 and used as a place to get water for travelers moving through the area. Called the Leavings because it was where the trail left a water supply, it was one of only four stops between Fort McLeod and Calgary that was used as a camping ground. By the late 1870s, Henry Kuntz, a former bison hunter that I mentioned, set up a stopping house. The stopping house was purchased in 1882 by J.R. Craig, who was the first manager of the new Oxley Ranch, which covered 200,000 acres in the area. He built the log house and the barn on the property that you can still see to this day. On the floor of the barn there are inscriptions of 1884 and cattle brands left there by those who worked at the location. In 1886, and continuing until 1903, the Northwest Mounted Police used the location as a post, sending patrols north and west through the Porcupine Hills. At this time, the house and barn were rented by the Northwest Mounted Police from Craig. The location was recognized as a provincial historic site on January 17, 2006. Located 20 kilometers west of Clare's home on Linden Road, you will find the Old Circle L Ranch, which is a collection of historic buildings that showcase cattle ranching and rural life from the turn of the century. The buildings consist of a ranch house, bunk house, ice house, log barn, hay shed, and machine buggy shed. The ranch dates back to 1896 when the land was claimed by Charles Linden and his family. They would build a main house that year, and throughout the years would build various buildings on the property, including the barn in 1919. From 1896 to 1904, the ranch expanded by purchasing land from the Hudson's Bay Company and the federal government, and through the filing of homestead applications by family members. By 1919, William Linden, the son of Charles, owned 14 quarter sections, and the family would remain on the ranch until 1966. And the site was proclaimed a provincial historic resource on January 10, 2004. When you step into the museum in Clare's home, you're stepping into history, literally. The Canadian Pacific Railway Station was built in 1911 and served as the main transportation locale for the community and area from that year until 1966. The building was made of sandstone consisting of the original 1893 sandstone used at the 9th Avenue CPR Depot in Calgary, which was dismantled and transported to Clare's home. The west wing of the materials of the depot went to Clare's home, while the east wing of materials went to High River. As a result, Clare's home has one of only two remaining sandstone stations in Alberta. By the 1950s, the use of rail was declining, and in 1966, a station was no longer needed. It was then converted into a museum, remaining on its original site. On November 23, 2004, it was listed as a provincial historic resource. Bernie Sparks One interesting fact about Claire's home is that the community has some of the best curlers the country has ever seen. In 1951, the Kennedy Rink would represent Southern Alberta at the Briar, and four years later, the Brown Rink represented all of Alberta at the Briar, but no person has achieved the amount of fame in curling as Bernie Sparks. Sparks was born in Claire's home in 1940 to Leslie and Daisy Sparks, who had come to Claire's home five years previous. From an early age, he excelled at sports, including baseball and hockey. In 1955, he joined the All-Star Tigers baseball team that won the Canadian Pony Championship, and he was picked up by the Detroit Tigers, who took him to Florida. Homesick, he decided to come back to Claire's home and went back to curling, something he had started at 15 and continued to practice at every chance he could. It helped that his father was the ice maker in the community. He would gain his first major championship in 1958, when he skipped the high school rink and won the Alberta Briar, and then took third at the Canadian Briar. In 1960, he won the Canadian Championship in Halifax as part of the Northcott Rink, and in 1968 and 1969, he won the World Championship with the same rink. Also in 1969, the rink won the Silver Broom, Bonspiel, and Perth, Scotland. Due to his success, the Northcott Ring was the Grand Marshal of the Calgary Stampede that year. In all, the team won three World Curling Championship golds in 1966, 1968, and 1969. Sparks eventually moved to British Columbia, where he was on eight BC Championship teams in 1972, 1973, 1974, 1976, 1978, 1983, 1984, and 1987. 
With British Columbia meeting New Brunswick in this fourth draw, two veteran Briar competitors were throwing Skip's Rocks. Lying four in this fifth end, Bernie Sparks of BC wants his last stone in the house. Good sweeping brings it into the 12 foot, and now BC lies five. Playing out of the Fredericton Curling Club, Southpaw Dave Sullivan is making his third Briar appearance. With five enemy rocks facing him, Sullivan needs a draw close to the forefoot to save losing a big end. And he gets it. New Brunswick picks up one to go ahead 4-3 after five ends. Leading 7-4 in this 10th end, Sullivan asks his third John Gorman to draw to a nest of BC rocks. The Westerners lie four and have last drop. Gorman goes with the inter. It looks heavy. Slides inches wide, but stays to lie shot on the edge of the forefoot. Sparks calls for a double raise from his third, Brock Giles, one of the three Giles brothers on his rink. It's a real pressure shot. Slips past the long guard, and it's a great stone. DC now lies five. John Gorman calls for some house cleaning, and Sullivan applies the power. When it's all over, British Columbia lies two. With a third rock at the back of the house, Sparky is after the chip and roll. He throws the out turn. It's a perfect shot, and BC lies four. Last rock, Sullivan needs the hit and roll behind the BC stone, but he has that long guard to get past. He's past the guard and gets the hit and the roll. New Brunswick is shot. The decision is made and Brock Giles goes in to hold the broom for Bernie Sparks. He's going for the chip and roll. Sparky must get past the long guard, his own stone in the eight foot, and hope he doesn't roll out himself. Put all these pieces together and the result is the perfect stone. BC counts four to go ahead, 8-7. New Brunswick scored two in the 11th end to lead 9-8 going home. Bernie Sparks had the opportunity in the 12th to hit and count two, but was narrow on the shot, missing the open takeout, and enabling New Brunswick to steal one and go on to win 10-8. After finishing in the runner-up position in the 1987 Labatt Briar, he chose to retire. In 1974, Sparks was inducted into the Curling Canada Hall of Fame. He is also a member of the Southern Alberta Curling Hall of Fame and the Lethbridge Sports Hall of Fame for baseball. In 1995, he was inducted into the BC Sports Hall of Fame. Louise McKinney By far the most famous resident to come from Claire's home was Louise McKinney, who would make her mark as one of the famous five, among other major accomplishments. Originally born in Frankville, Ontario in 1868, she originally wanted to be a doctor, but circumstances of the time prevented this, so she trained as a teacher. After teaching in Ontario and North Dakota where she met her husband James, she would move to Claire's home with him in 1903, just as the community was starting to grow. A devout Christian with her husband, they would build the village's Methodist church. She would also organize the ladies' aid within the church, and the home of McKinney and her husband would serve as a centre for church life and the couple were always helping needy families in the area. Helping to organize the local temperance groups, she would gain prominence throughout the next decade, and in 1917 became the first woman elected to the Alberta Legislature, and the first woman elected to a legislature in all of the British Empire. The man she defeated in the elections was William Moffat, the first resident and first mayor of Clare's home I had mentioned. In her capacity as MLA, she would work to improve the legal status of widows and separated wives, getting the Dower Act bill drafted and passed in the legislature. 
Serving until 1921, she would continue to advocate for women's suffrage and temperance. It was in her role of women's suffrage that she became involved in the Persons case as one of the famous five. The case would lead to a constitutional ruling that established the right of women to be appointed to the Senate and legally recognized as persons under the British North America Act. The ruling also meant that women could no longer be denied rights based on a narrow interpretation of the law. Today, when the problems of government the world over are essentially human problems, and our very homes and all that we hold most sacred are threatened by appalling dangers from without and by subversive forces from within, it is well that our national existence should be fortified by the participation in its affairs of those who are so exceptionally qualified to contribute to human well-being and to the preservation of the foundations of home and community life. It is with thoughts and convictions such as these that on behalf of the Canadian Federation of Business and Professional Women's Clubs, I now unveil the tablet which the Federation has erected in honor of the five women whose names it records. We now introduce one of the five women, an author, a well-known speaker, and the woman member of the Board of Governors of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, our own uh, Mrs. Nellie L. McClellan. <laughs> Madam President, Mr. Prime Minister, fellow Canadians, I desire to thank the Prime Minister and the President, too, for their kind words. And I thank the Prime Minister still more for the kindness he showed to our little petition when it was just a little scrap of paper going the rounds and not very welcome any place. I also wish to thank Newton Wesley Rowell for his kindness in taking our petition to the Privy Council. And I also wish to thank Lord Sankey for his glorious decision. I would like very much tonight, dear friends, if I could express the corporate mind not only of the five of us, but of all the people who have advanced the cause of women by ways seen and unseen. The great unnumbered, the unremembered and unknown people who have done so much for us. The people whose names will never appear in the papers. The people whose names we will never know. Because it has been a long task. It, was a, it has been an epic story, this rise of women. They had to begin from so far down Women had first to convince the world that they had souls, and then that they had minds, and then it came on to this matter of political entity. And uh, the end is not yet. <laughs> we fear that there are still people who would sign a minority report. Now I do wish to pay my tribute of love and admiration to the other four women whose friendship I enjoyed and treasured for their loyalty, for their love, and for their steadfastness, for their wonderful companionship, Mrs. McKinney, Mrs. Muir Edwards, and Mrs. Parlby, whose message you will hear just in a moment. And particularly, I wish to give my tribute of praise to our undaunted and indomitable, and incomparable leader, Emily F. Murphy. She didn't care who got the honor. She was never one to care who got the vote of thanks. She would joyfully pin a medal any time on somebody else. And you know, dear friends, I can't help but saying it now that we're all here together, that we would all be able to accomplish a great deal more if none of us cared who got the credit. And tonight, if she is listening, from some of the islands of the blessed. I'm sure that there is no person who will hear the words of this ceremony with a lighter and a merrier heart. Soon after the legendary ruling, Louise McKinney would organize a reading club in Claire's home with Florence Gray, and McKinney was elected as the first president of the Women's Reading Club. She would be made the vice president of the Imperial Order of Daughters of Alberta, and became the first woman to have her portrait painted and hung in the legislative building in Edmonton. 
Two years after the successful resolution of the person's case, McKinney became ill while attending a convention in Toronto and would pass away upon her return to Clara's home on July 10, 1931. Her husband died the next year. In 1939, she was recognized as a person of national historic significance, and in Claire's home, a plaque honors her at the post office, and the person's case was recognized as a historic event in 1997. Statues of McKinney also exist in several places, including Calgary and on Parliament Hill itself. In 2009, McKinney, along with the other four of the famous five, were made honorary senators. I hope you enjoyed this episode of my look at Claire's home, Alberta. If you did, please leave a rating and review. If you like, you can email me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can visit my website where you'll find hundreds of articles on Canada's history as well as all my podcast episodes. Just go to canadaehx.com. And again, you can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash canadaehx. Just like all of these wonderful patrons have. And I apologize if I mispronounce any names. Lori Ann Kirby, Gary Dolovich, Nick Zinri, Pamela Elder, Shannon Marshall, Clinton Martinez, Dimitri Chauve, Aaron O'Hara Myers, Robert Dunseith, Todd Casey, Catherine Roa, Luke S., Vic Hedges, J.P. Bear, Jason Hall, Phil Maynard, Spencer M., and Iris Gray. As well, you can find me on Facebook. Just search for Canadian History X. Remember, that's E-H-X. I'm on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D. And don't forget, you can find me on Instagram. Just search for Bairdo37. Thanks. We'll see you again next time.